Yeonmi Park is probably the world's most famous North Korean defector. This is someone who has left North Korea in search for a better life, and these defectors more often than not find a life for themselves as a public speaker, doing speaking events on TV or for different forums around the world in an effort to bring awareness to the quote human rights abuses taking place in North Korea. And this is exactly the case for Yanmi Park. Long story short, Yanmi Park was born in 1993 in the northern part of North Korea, which is the poorest part of the country. And in 2007, she left for China, which every North Korean actually has the right to travel to China. And she eventually made it to South Korea in 2009, and this is when she became an activist for human rights. Or still to this day, she continues to fight for those same human rights all around the world in an effort to end global suffering. <laughs> Two years ago in yeah. Chicago, yeah. during yeah. the like BLM test, yeah. protest, I got robbed by several black women. They yeah. punched me, they took my wallet out of me. Whoa. In front of my son. And then I was trying to call police on them. Obviously, anybody do when they get robbed. Yeah. People on the street circle me and then screaming at me that I'm a racist. Before diving deep into the character that is Yanmi Park, let's first take a look back at the history of North Korea. Because I think it's really important before we start talking about this to get the full scope of North Korea and all that has happened up until today. Because Yanmi Park's experiences growing up in a post-Soviet DPRK are still incredibly valid experiences and should still be taken seriously. <laughs> Hey, comrade Casey here. <laughs> okay, so this is a map of Korea, the Korean Peninsula. And this is dated, this map itself is dated to 1953, which is the year the Korean War ended. Now, I've talked about this before on my channel. Now, that's a war that we really don't talk about anymore in the United States, even though it's literally active. And that's because it's the most evil thing we've ever done as a country. It was so bloody, so gruesome. Um, I don't think many people really know how horrible the Korean War was. But I must reiterate it once again, this war was incredibly inhumane and incredibly bloody. Because if you didn't know, this whole war started when we basically invaded the southern part of the Korean Peninsula five years after World War II. Now this video is not supposed to be in any part about the history of the DPRK, so I'm just gonna go really quick through this, uh, but I just think it'd be a little helpful to give a little bit of context for this whole situation. So basically what happened is that because Japan had the Korean Peninsula after, uh, by the time World War II ended, um, it now became granted over, I guess, to the USSR and the United States. The United States got the southern part and uh, the USSR got the northern part. Eventually, everyone kind of agreed that they wanted to become the northern part, that, which was the more uh, better uh, economic system in their eyes. But the United States did not like that, so then they invaded and basically um, fought the north, which acted on behalf of the USSR, um, until eventually they got the ceasefire. But this war had three million deaths, and half of those were civilians. And the US dropped infinitely more bombs on the Korean Peninsula than they did Japan during World War II. And the US military targeted really important structures like power plants and farms and factories and government buildings, and they even purposefully poisoned the soil. And during this war, bomber pilots were basically instructed to bomb any structure taller than one store. And at the very end of this Korean War, pilots were stating that they had nothing left to bomb. They were flying all over the place and they could not find a single thing left a bomb. Okay, so then the ceasefire happened in 1963, and no warfare, no active warfare has been happening since then. Uh, but the United States, you know, they have their ways to continue the war up until today. And I can make those people then say, maybe they be happy for a while. So once the ceasefire was in place, the DPRK had a lot of recovering to do. But thanks to the USSR, they at least had a helpful hand uh, in this recovery. They had someone that they could trade with um, and boost their economy right after the war. But once the USSR fell in 1991, uh, North Korea was really all by itself. And it was at the full behest of the United States and their sanctions and embargoes. So the fact that Yanmi Park was born in 1993 
in a post-Soviet DPRK at a time when the country was in a lonesome struggle against the United States. It's incredibly evident that her escaping the country was what was best for her and her family at the time. I don't want this video to come across as something it's not. The experiences and perspective of all North Korean defectors are incredibly valid because life in North Korea going all the way back until the end of World War II has been an incredible struggle, especially when the United States is deliberately sanctioning things like farming equipment, like fertilizer and tractors, in order to stop the country from developing any further. What I want to illustrate and show in this video is that these defectors, specifically people like Yan Mi Park, are a part of a propaganda campaign and pipeline of abuse by the South Korean government. In 2013, these clips are from an amazing video on YouTube called Loyal Citizens of Pyongyang in Seoul. And it does a great job of telling the stories of defectors who were basically lured into South Korea by the South Korean government in order to be used as pawns in this game of propaganda against North Korea. 12 North Korean restaurant workers and their manager made news in 2016 by defecting to South Korea. The NIS said that these girls defected on their own free will and accepted them based on humanitarian grounds. This same restaurant staff made news in recent months again when the manager who led the 12 young girls to South Korea revealed that he actually tricked the girls to defecting. But even after the manager stepped forward to announce that the NIS bribed him to kidnap the 12 girls, the NIS still has not returned the girls to their homes and families in North Korea. Now that we've gone over all that depressing explanation stuff, now we can really get to the juice. It's basically the job of these North Korean defectors, once taken under the wing of the South Korean intelligence agency, to basically come up with the craziest stories they could possibly imagine coming from the DPRK. Because for whatever reason, Americans are incredibly gullible to what's happening outside of America. I heard he loves cognac and Swiss cheese. What is and oh, cognac and Swiss yeah, cheese? Cognac. cognac. Yeah, cognac. Cognac is crazy. And Swiss what? cheese. Yeah. Oh, wow. He drinks 13 bottles of wine each night. That's why he's so fat. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. So cognac, Swiss cheese, and wine. Yeah. And he's just getting massages all day. And he's like one of those uh, Wagyu cows yeah. or whatever. Oh, and yeah. Kobe beef. Kobe beef. Yeah. yeah, he's like Kobe beef. So they picked this beautiful girls to massage the cow that he eats. That's literally one of the pleasure squad tasks. So the girls have to be beautiful just to massage the cow. Yeah, they don't use a tool. They have to hand the massage a cow for the dear leader to take. The wildest and most obvious made up stuff comes from her YouTube channel, where she really just seems to be making all of this stuff up completely on the fly. So sarcasm is banned in North Korea. If you be sarcastic, especially about the leader and the party, not only yourself going to be executed, the three generations of your family gonna be executed and sent to police court prison camps with you. North Korea sucks! Right, this country that has been a non-stop occupation by first Japan and then now America, they're definitely spending all of their resources on the joke police. They're intricately analyzing every joke as they walk through town, and if they hear even a little bit of irony used in said joke, three generations of your family is going to be in prison. North Korea blows, man. In North Korea, parents cannot feed their children. We, we give them a mud because children are so hungry. And when you eat mud, you die in 10 days. You cannot go to the bathroom. Even though you know your children are dying, you're still giving them the mud because what's the matter? Like you're going to die anyway. Dude, North Korea sucks. You can't even eat mud these days without dying. What's up with that? What's up with North Korean mud? Sometimes even I get a little carried away. I see some mud, sometimes it has that perfect consistency, you know? And I start eating a little bit of it, but then I remember what Yanmi Park said. She said, if you eat mud, you cannot poop. I remember that, I think of it, and then I... 
I, I stop eating that mud. It's just so yummy. But really the greatest problem I have with Yanmi Park is that the things she's saying aren't completely false. She's not lying all the time. For example, she made this video talking about things you can't buy in North Korea. And when I watch this video, I honestly believe pretty much everything she's saying. She talks about not being able to buy things like condoms and birth control, as well as general hygiene products. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if these are just some luxuries that you generally have a hard time finding in North Korea. But the issue of Yanmi Park talking about these things is that she's always talking about it in a way where she's blaming North Korea. She's saying that the country of North Korea is choosing not to make these products accessible to their people by at least having them up for sale. I mean, obviously in the United States, these aren't incredibly accessible to people either. A lot of people have a really hard time finding these products, which is really unfortunate. Uh, in comparison to North Korea, which stereotypically here is kind of the worst place in the world. Uh, but at the very least, uh, you can purchase them here, and I feel like that might be the case in North Korea, but very understandably, it's probably not easy to get. So while she's explaining it in a way where it's the fault of North Korea, it's really the fault of the United States who is deliberately not allowing the sale and trade of these products to the country of North Korea. And that's why this is all kind of a difficult conversation to have. Because when I hear these wild and extravagant stories coming out of North Korea, they're still based in a lot of truth. There's a legitimate foundation of pain and struggle that every North Korean has faced for the past century. But when these defectors go on TV and do these talks and discussions, these issues are never really talked about in good faith. Everything is labeled as the fault of North Korea, and all of these claims aren't being used as an argument against American sanctions, but rather they're being used as a weapon in order to manufacture consent for more intervention in North Korea, something that would only make the lives of North Koreans even worse. Thanks so much for watching this video and hearing me out, but please don't look past these defectors for what they have to say, because their experiences and perspectives are still incredibly valid. These are real people that really experienced hardship in the DPRK, but simply take it with a grain of salt and understand that the people funding and organizing these talks have much different intentions than you probably assume. I'm Comrade Casey, peace and love.